so uh, better late than never. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy uh, that we were able to give you that, that award, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I, I remember uh, a comment made by Monsignor Calkins, who's here, and he said he was very blessed to have you as his, uh, as his doctoral director, his, his doctor father. And he said, you know, he's a great, he's a brilliant scholar and a very holy man. That's a wonderful and rare combination. And I, I, everything I've seen has just verified that. And your humility shines forth. I'm going to be speaking, and I have to always watch the time, because uh, it could go on and on. So I'll I, watch it, Mark. So I have to. <laughs> okay, well, he's, uh, yes, we go on to what time? Uh, uh, ten, 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 uh, 10.15, so, so we so have I, a coffee break and can continue right. the discussion. Five, five after, about five after, I'll try to break. That's why I put together an outline. All of you have an outline. Um, mm -hmm. That is Father Peter Fellner on divine maternity. Some of them are front and back, others are stapled. I have some extra up here, but I'm going to be speaking from this outline, okay? And uh, because I find that helpful in teaching and so on. But I'm talking about the divine maternity... <clears throat> and, of course, I, I, I teach Mariology, uh, among other subjects, at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. And uh, it's an elective now. I hope someday uh, it will be a required course, as it should be at every major seminary in the world, a Catholic seminary in the world, I think. But in terms of divine maternity or Mary as the mother of God, we could think of just approaching it in terms of the Council of Ephesus and why she's honored with the title Theotokos and so on. But looking at Father Peter Del, uh, uh, Damien Fellner's uh, meditations and work and scholarship on divine maternity, it shows how the divine maternity is linked or connected or interwoven with so much else in terms of ecclesiology, Christology, but especially Mariology. So having said that, Mary is not just simply the mother of God, she is the predestined mother of God. She is the ever-virgin mother of God. She is the immaculate mother of God. She is the mother of the incarnate word who is the head of the church, and therefore she is the mother of the church, or as uh, Lumen Gentium 61 put it, she is mater nobis in ordine gratiae, our mother in the order of grace. So I'd like to look at how all of these are interconnected using, for the most part, the words of Father Fellner himself. Now, it's interesting, when I, when I teach Mariology, sometimes students are shocked, seminarians are shocked when they hear, Mary was predestined. I said, well, that's dogma. Mm -hmm. It's taught by, by Vatican II. And, uh, well, when was she predestined? I said, well, how about ab initio et ante secula? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know that's, that was in the fabulis deus, you know, uh, the proclamation of the, uh, the Immaculate Conception, or even more strongly from Lumen Gentium 61, ab eterno, you know, that, that from eternity she was predestined. But, you know, it's connected, as um, Father Fellner shows, uh, to... Uh, the teaching of Duns Scotus, Blessed John Duns Scotus, that the predestination of the incarnate word must be linked to the predestination of the mother. Because how else are you going to have an incarnate word unless you're a, a docetist or you just say Jesus, you know, the, the word becomes incarnate from, from whom? Uh, from the Blessed Virgin Mary. So Blessed Pius IX writes in 1854, God ineffable, from the beginning and before the ages, chose and ordained a mother for his only begotten Son, from whom he would become incarnate and be born in the blessed fullness of time. Now, in the ellipsis that's following uh, the, both uh, Schoenmetzer and Hünermann in, in the Denzinger, there is, it also mentions foreseeing the fall, foreseeing the, the fall of, of man. So it, it includes both, you could say, the, the Scotist view and also the Thomistic view. But it's from Abenizio, it's from the beginning. You see, God foresees all.
from the beginning. And then from Vatican II, predestined from eternity, ab eterno, to be the mother of God by that decree of divine providence which also determined the incarnation of the Word. The Blessed Virgin was in this earth the Virgin Mother of the Redeemer and above all others, and in a singular way, the generous associate, generosa socia, and humble handmaid of the Lord. So in terms of this, uh, Mary's divine maternity is predestined according to Blessed John Duns Scotus and the Catholic Magisterium, as we have seen. It is a joint predestination of Mary's divine maternity and in the Incarnation. And this is how Father Fellner uh, explains it. The Incarnation of the Savior is willed absolutely prior to any consideration uh, of sin or of creation, in that sense independently of both. On the other hand, both creation and afterwards the redemption of mankind are willed dependently in view of the Incarnation, the central mystery of salvation affected through the divine virginal maternity. Hence, within the one act of jointly predestining, predestining all in Christ, there is a more restricted sense of joint predestination, namely that of the elect to be uh, that of one of the elect to be the mother of the incarnate head savior and so mediatrix of all graces that is the person through whom the mediator comes to us and through whom we are incorporated into Christ i think what's behind this is god's plan to join to create and then join creation to himself through the incarnation but then mary cannot be written out of this plan she's central to the plan of god St. John Paul II uh, was quite emphatic about this in both Redemptoris Mater and also uh, Dignitatis, Mulier, uh, uh, Dignitatis Mulierum, uh, that Mary is at the very center of salvation history. Why? Because the incarnate word is at the center of salvation history and really of all creation, at the very heart of creation. Now, maybe we could get back to that of Mary as the predestined mother of God but she is also the ever-virgin mother of God. And she is, of course, a virgin before conceiving Jesus. She is a mother in part two, in giving birth, and she is perpetually a virgin. And so this is the, the bodily integrity of the virginitas in part two. Now, I, I, I always believed in that Mary's bodily integrity was preserved. Um, I, did, I, 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 I tried to figure out what is the uh, theological note, and I think I was misled in some conversations with a Jesuit colleague, uh, Father J. Michael McDermott, as, uh, who was once a member of the International Theological Commission, but he's in good company because I think the s similar confusion was in the younger days of Cardinal Gerhard Müller you know, influenced by Rahner, that it doesn't really, to be a virgin means never to have sexual intercourse. So if Mary's ever virgin, obviously she was a mother in giving birth. So some of them don't see the, the significance of the preservation of the physical sign of her virginity. And this came up at, at Vatican II, as many of you know. And in the schema of 1962, it, it, it says, he will, qui, Christ, qui vol, voluit, integritatem matris, you know, uh, in ipsum et partu, incorruptam atque illibatam. So he willed the uh, corporal or the bodily integrity of the mother to remain incorrupt and unsustained in childbirth itself. And then this was changed in what came to be Lumen Gentium 57, you know, uh, who did not diminish but sanctified her virginal integrity. Qui virginia, virginialum eus integritatem non minuit sed secravit. So th there was a discussion, and I looked through the Acta, and there was apparently a rather vigorous discussion. Um, the bishops of Abruzzo, Italy, said corporal bodily must be in there. That's the tradition of the church. And then it was... Uh, it was the head of the Jesuits, Jean-Baptiste Janssen, who
who said, well, we're not denying it, but it doesn't really seem to have been a teaching of the early fathers. It only began with St. Saint, Saint Ambrose, so raising the doubt about it. Then it was proposed by the Scandinavian bishops a compromise formula, but, but still the truth that they would have instead of bodily integrity, virginal integrity, but the footnotes there, especially to the Lateran Synod of 649, which anathematized those who denied the threefold virginity. And if, if you just simply have the, if the virginitas in part two means the same as just being a virgin, then why do we have a threefold virginity? I'm also grateful to Monsignor Calkins for his excellent article on this. So I think it's now not just simply, uh, well, Suarez had said it was theologically certain, and it was at least, uh, uh, Ludwig Ott said it's the general teaching of the church that her bodily integrity was preserved. I think it's de fide, by virtue of the ordinary universal magisterium. So I, I've, I've changed my mind on this, and I never doubted it. It was just trying to specify the theological note. But what is the reason why? We could just speak, a, you know, uh, uh, from authority, uh, and of course many fine books on Mariology say here's an example of a dogma by virtue of the ordinary universal magisterium, the threefold virginity. Um, but what is the reason for it? Well, Father Fellner points out that some people deny this because they have trouble with the miraculous. They, because it would take a miracle. I mean, uh, the, uh, the German, uh, the German uh, physician Albert Mitterer wrote a book in 1952 on uh, dogma and biology in the Holy Family according to St. Thomas Aquinas. And it received an imprimatur, but he questioned whether or not really the physical virginity needed to be, uh, to, to be preserved. And then Jean Gallo in 1960 wrote an article uh, siding with, uh, with uh, Mitterer's viewpoint. That caught the, the attention of the, um, of, this, uh, of the Holy Office then, and there was a monitum. There's a, now, some people say, well, why wasn't the monitum, if this was really a heresy, why wasn't it therefore you know, made public? And if it was a heresy, why didn't, why, why didn't Vatican II specify it? Well, you know, I, I thought about this, and it's a bad argument, I think, though, uh, uh, to say that because the magisterium doesn't use the strongest reaction to a heretical teaching, therefore it's not heretical. I mean, after all, Hans Küng denied the infallibility of the Pope. He could have been excommunicated. I mean, that's, 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 uh, that's heresy. Uh, and it was persistent. Uh, but instead his license, not to drive, but his license <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to, to, to represent himself as a Catholic theologian. But in terms of, of, of this, um, it's also that Mary is completely virginal, body and soul, body and sp uh, spirit. That if she's just, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of negative virginity, you know, that she never engaged in the marital act, but it's a consecrated virginity. You know, and that goes back, you know, to Gregory of Nyssa and St. Augustine that she made a vow of virginity mm -hmm. or resolved to remain a virgin. So this is how uh, Father uh, uh, Peter uh, describes it in my number two there. Mary remained ever virgin. Indeed, it means that the great sign of salvation is Mary herself as virgin mother. It means that the core of her interior life, of her consent to the incarnation, to the primary decree of God's will, of her fiat, of her association in Christ's ministry, and of her work as mediatrix of all grace, is the integrity of her soul and body. Here we see the perfect integration of grace and nature. Okay. Now, of course, it's, it's affirmed in the Proto-Evangelium, the Proto-Gospel of St. James, you know, the, the physical virginity, but it's testified even by the, the uh, St. Leo the Great and St. Uh, Ambrose, who are cited in the footnote to Lumen Gentium uh, 57. But I think that, that, that she would not be totally, completely virginal if she was not virgin body and soul. Okay? And it's a sign of her total uh, dedication. And then some people are like, well, if, if she gave birth, then how could she preserve her physical virginity? Well, it's a miracle. And Francisco Suarez spends quite a bit of time talking about this. And then he says, 
you know, it must have been in, in some ineffable way, unknown to us, how the baby Jesus could go through those narrow passages. But then he says, he says, stop, let's not discuss this too, too much out of modesty for the great mother of God. When I read this, I said, it's too late, Francisco, you've already discussed it in great detail. But, <laughs> but, but, um, but in any case, um, Mary as the immaculate mother of God, so she is the predestined mother of God. She's the ever-virgin mother of God. She's the immaculate mother of God. And this is the link of her predestination and her dignity as mother of God with her immaculate conception, being free from all sin, original as well as actual. And Father uh, Peter puts it this way. Mary would not have existed except that the Incarnation was de facto decreed as the reason for creation. This is a marvelous insight. She would not have existed if it had not been for the decree of the Incarnation. See? That means that Mary, in her being and in her activity, is totally related to Christ and to the work of salvation and redemption. The perfection of human existence and personal freedom is directly proportionate to its assimilation within the totality of Mary's relation to Christ and to his work. This is what it means to be full of grace, so holy that one can contribute to the sanctification of others even if sanctified by the merits of Christ. Mary is in some true manner the maternal mediatrix of all persons, as Christ's mother, bringing him to us, as the mother of the church and of, and of believers, bringing us uh, uh, to, uh, to Christ. I think part of it might have gotten uh, a little cut off there. Okay. Now, so she is the immaculate mother of God. She's full of grace because her role as mother of God is not simply to give birth to conceive and give birth to the Redeemer, but she's joined with him as mother of his body, the church. Well, we'll get to that more. Now, number four here, she is the Theotokos, the birth giver of God, or the, the God-bearer, as it's sometimes translated. And she's related to both the, this is number four, the Incarnation and the Holy Trinity. And this is where... Uh, um, these two Franciscan themes, which uh, Father Hellman had beautifully brought out, come into, into focus here with, the, with Mary's divine maternity, that she is intimately related to the life of the Holy Trinity and especially the Holy Spirit, and also in terms of the incarnation, the sacred humanity of Christ. So there's two beautiful passages of, of Father Peter uh, I'd like to read. The first one, the mystery of virginity in Mary, as so many Greek fathers stress, is intimately linked both to the reality of divine being and to the direct knowledge of divinity. In giving birth, Mary's body remained incorrupt and integral, just as the Godhead in the eternal generation of the Son from the Father remained undivided and integral, another reason for the physical virginity of Mary. Thus, the virginal maternity on earth reveals the eternal generation of the Son from the Father and so makes manifest not only the Son, but the Father as well. He who sees me sees the Father also, John 14, 9. In enabling us to see the Son, the Virgin Mary also reveals the Father and therefore the Holy Spirit in whom the Father and the Son are one in love. Mary, then, is our teacher in, of theology, something beautifully brought out by, by Pope Francis in December when he met with the members of the International Theological Commission. He referred to Mary as the uh, teacher of authentic theology, you know, la maestra dell'autentica teologia. So it's, it's there. She's the teacher of authentic theology. She because she teaches us about, uh, she leads us to her son. She teaches us about God and the things of God because she is mother of God. In a word, she is mater et magistra, mother and teacher 
and without her no one could learn about God or teach the word of God in truth. Again, an insight on the Feast of, of the Divine Maternity on January 1st. Pope Francis said, uh, we cannot know Jesus without the mother, without his mother. Non si può capire Gesù senza sua madre. Now, now this, this is Mary's role. She reveals the Trinity to us. But she also, this is, uh, Mary is central to the Franciscan uh, theology, Franciscan spirituality, and the linking of the devotion to the sacred humanity of Christ with Marian devotion, which is central uh, to the Franciscan uh, spirit. So Father P uh, Peter writes, the reason for St. Francis's extraordinary devotion to the Virgin Mary and his surrounding her with ineffable praise, according to Thomas of Celano and St. Bonaventure, is to be found in the fact that she made the Lord of Majesty one of us and accessible to us. So she makes accessible the incarnate word. Out of this devotion to the incarnation, above all for its own sake, came the famous celebration of Christmas in Grecio toward the end of his life with the Christmas crash and so forth. He who has not understood Christmas has not understood the decisive element of human existence. It is humility which makes one truly human, one in the love of God, humble, human, homo, all derived from the same root, humus, or earth, from which the first man was formed and named Adam, from the earth. The virgin earth is a type of the virgin mother who begot the new Adam for all his members. This is why Marian devotion is inseparable from the devotion of Grecio and for the love of the heart of Jesus in the Eucharistic ministry, mystery. Thus the kindness and humility, humanity, humility of God has appeared in Christ Jesus, Son of the Heavenly Father and Son of Mary, shown to us in Bethlehem. So this is really Franciscan spirituality would have to be incarnational, Marian, and Eucharistic. All three are at the heart of Franciscan spirituality. Knowing Franciscans, I've always seen this, if they're true to their charism. And I think to be Catholic also <laughs> is to be devoted to the Mother of God, to the Incarnate Word, and to the Eucharist. Now, Mary is the Mother of Christ's body, number five, the Church. How Mary, as Mater Nobis in Ordine Gratiae, our Mother in the Order of Grace, mediates divine life to the children of her Son. Well, the... the uh, Due maybe to the, strongly to the influence of the, the, the Germans and, 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 and the, uh, the Dutch at Vatican II, some of these titles that are <laughs> well established regarding Mary were, were used very modestly or removed, such as co-redemptrix was removed because it was thought that it would be uh, difficult to understand for the separated brethren, though in the Octa, the Praetor Tanda, the 62 scheme, it says it's a, th these are among the titles that are Licet in se verissima, most true in themselves, or absolutely true in themselves. But she is called Mater Nobis in Ordine Gratiae, our mother in the order of grace. This could be a, a more polite way of saying she is the mediatrix of all graces, which was used in the 62 schema, approved of by St. John the Twenty-Third. She was called, uh, you know, mediatrix omnium gratiarum. Before he died, um, uh, Pope Benedict wrote a letter to Archbishop Zimolski uh, commending his, his uh, uh, mission to the World Day of Sick, and he re commended his mission, this is Pope Benedict XVI, in uh, January of 2013 to the Immaculate Mother, the Mediatrix of All Graces. I showed this to uh, Monsignor Gallagher, Daniel Gallagher, who works in the Latin office, and he kind of smiled. He says, I think I know... Uh, the Latin, uh, the Polish Latinist who, who drafted that. But he said the Pope signed it. It's his. So even Pope Benedict referred, you know, referred to her. 
but she is the, our mother in the order of grace. What does that mean? I think Father Fellner, as in so many things, says it so beautifully. The two aspects of the single maternal vocation of Mary in relation to Christ and the church are distinct. The first is in the order of nature and the second in the order of grace. The first involves the formation of the human body for the God-man. The second reanimates an already existing man with divine life, that is, all men in the state of original sin for being baptized. I think it's a marvelous insight. And Mary is the natural mother, uh, the mother of Christ, but she is our mother in the order of grace. Now, Nevertheless, they both pertain to a single mother and a single motherhood. Divine maternity and spiritual maternity are both real maternity, not simply metaphorical. In the case of the word become flesh, that divine filiation is natural. Jesus is not a second adopted son of God, as Nestorius erroneously proposed. In the case of the members of the church, Mary's children are truly hers, which means we are truly her children. Mary's children are truly hers, yet adopted, and so are also adopted children of the Father and brothers and sisters of Jesus. Indeed, adopted and not natural, as is Jesus by virtue of his being eternally generated, and yet we are really and not merely legally children of the Father and co-heirs of Christ, and temples of the Holy Spirit. It's not just a legal uh, adoption. We are truly sons and daughters of the Father. But all of this is possible only because of the Incarnation, and the Incarnation is only possible because of the predestined, immaculate, ever-Virgin Mother of God. Thank you. One brief comment before Father Peter responds to Robert, and I think now we get a hint, a small hint, of why the members of the Mariological Society of America elected Robert the president. No, no, there was no one else that wanted to do it. (laughs) That's okay. Thank you. (laughs) Faute de mieux, as they say in French. (laughs) Father Peter. That was a very fine summary of my reflections on the mystery of the divine maternity, the virginal maternity, and going out uh, uh, how in so many different ways uh, 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 formulate uh, or one point concern. The other is simply once mother, always mother. Once incarnate, always incarnate. You cannot separate uh, pray, we, the divine maternity. It, it pertains only to that first biological movement. Then we forget about it. About it. This is part of the difficulty in explaining to many people how Our Lady is the universal media, mediatrix of all, gra- all graces. This is how she has an active role, role at the moment of our Lord's sacrifice on, on, on Calvary. Another point is discussed uh, discuss in the, uh, those circles, circles that are, uh, are uh, inclined to be very speculative, uh, speculative uh, the so-called principle of Mariology, first principle. And there are all sorts of solutions given, but the two most common is that which is stressed uh, by the Thomistic school, divine maternity. And that's true. You know, uh, so, and the Franciscan school, there are not all of them, but many of them, say Maximilian Kolbe, for, for instance, but uh, again, many of the followers of Dunscot is across the center, it's the Immaculate Conception. Actually, uh, it's not two different ti- uh, 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 titles to the uh, 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 titles, but uh, two aspects of one of the same mysterious, myster- uh, mysterious pr- uh, principle, which requires a great deal of, of uh, a theological uh, ex- expertise to discover the nature of the reasoning of such that you cannot simply reduce it to an Aristotelian syllogism. But our lady, uh, lady's answer to uh, St. Bernadette it helps us. Uh, when uh, St. Bernadette asks, well, who are you? Uh, you? What's, your, what's your name? I have the Immaculate Conception, not simply for the first moment of her, her biological existence, every moment is defined in one way or another by the mystery of the Immaculate immaculate Conception, and that is particularly true when we come to the question of a virginal maternity, whether we refer it 
to the coming of Christ, whether we refer to our being introduced, as it were, into that, uh, the, uh, into the mystery of the in, 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 incarnation. It's a point that can and you possibly de discussed, as it were, in a certain verified <laughs> circles of theolo uh, theology, but it helps to bring home, uh, home very important, uh, important points concerning who is Mary, the Immaculate Conception, and what is she here to do? That is the divine maternity, the spiritual maternity, but maybe you can say the miraculous virginal maternity, and that is to bring down heaven on, on, on earth, the, the, uh, the Son of the most, of most High God, and to lift us to the level of divine, divine, divine life. As you pointed out so well, a reason of adoption, but it is a real uh, uh, sonship. It is a real childhood. Thank you very much. I, I could only agree. I mean, I learned from you, so you, I'm mm. glad that what I said was faithful to no, what a, you, you, you have taught. It's a thought on the spur of the moment. You couldn't possibly say e e everything on, yeah. the, on this point, but the summary is, is excellent. It stimulates many other, many other thoughts. Well, thank you very much. It, it helped me to see how important Mary is really to the mm. whole mystery of yeah. Revelation and how That's she's something. so central to theology. This is something which is or generally overlooked. It's not overlooked in St. Bonaventure, Bonaventure, but uh, Our Lady is not the subject of a particular treatise. He says this explicitly in the Collationis and Examinum, Collation thir uh, 13. How do you answer the uh, question? If Our Lady is so important, why isn't there a treatise on it? Uh, because none is needed. <laughs> she's, in, <laughs> she's in every verse of Scripture from Genesis to, uh, to, to ap 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 Apocalypse because there is a Marian color to every part of the, 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 our, 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 our theology. And you brought it out very nicely in your reference to, reference to Our Lady and the Blessed, Blessed Trinity. The, the theology of the Trinity also involves a Marian, Marian, Marian dimension. Otherwise, we have to deny the joint predestination of Christ, uh, Christ and, and Mary as set forth, set forth in the uh, Idipopolis Deus of Pius IX. And that, that, is not, uh, 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 that uh, a phrase appears for the first time in that form, in that encyclical, but it is a summary of all the thinking of centuries on the, on the question of the Immaculate con Conception. And it almost as well echoes, echoes uh, uh, Scotus, uh, Scotus in his uh, the Ordinatio, question seven. Thank you. Distinction seven. Thank you. Uh, I think Monsignor Calkins has a... Well, I was, I was just thinking of, of supplements to some of these matters that you brought up. But of course, uh, one could put together an, a Marian encyclopedia through the, uh, the writings of Father Peter. But uh, on this um, second one, especially with regard to the Virginitas in Partu, Father wrote a pamphlet that was published several, oh gosh, I guess it was in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Then it was published, I think, in um, Miss uh, Immaculata Mediatrix in mm -hmm. Latin. I mean, in, in Italian as well. Uh, but it's called, um, is it the Virgin of the Sign? The Great Sign. Mm -hmm. The Great Sign. The Great Sign. That's and it's, a, it's a, a beautiful treatment of the Virginitas in part two. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I, I, well, the one passage I, I drew, I think, was from that. It was a several... You know, it was from that, but it, there's, it's, I'm grateful to, to be corrected on this. And not that I ever d doubted it. I mean, Suarez doesn't use the word de fide, but he says mm -hmm. it's certain. Mm -hmm. And he deals with Durandus and mm -hmm. others who, who raise questions about it, and also Erasmus mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well. And I think that, you know, Jean-Baptiste Janssen, and maybe he was influenced by Gallo's article in uh, La Nouvelle Théologie, uh, uh, La Nouvelle Revue Théologie, Theologique in 1960, which received a monitum, it generated mm -hmm. a monitum. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it showed that the, the, the Holy Office wouldn't accept this position, though they didn't condemn them as heretics. They just didn't want anything, anyone questioning mm -hmm. this. The the I think it has to do with with this this dogmatic minimalism, mm -hmm. and and that and and with Jensen's, they said, well, it wasn't there un clear until Saint Ambrose. Well, it's there in the 
in the uh, the proto gospel of James. I mean, we have a feast of Saint Joachim and Anne. Where do we know about their names? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I don't know where Patristics was at that time, but Saint Zeno of Verona, who he may not be able to be found on a medal struck on the Borgo Pio, yeah. but for <laughs> You know, Ambrose was under his influence, so far as patrologists know. He's writing it in the 370s. Yeah. And then you have the entire Eastern tradition uh, with Maximus the Confessor uh, yeah. may, uh, adopting it, potentially from Augustine. But then you have St. Sophronius of Jerusalem, who's the great champion against uh, monothelitism in a synodical letter, who's also using the triple virginity formula, and it's been an enshrined in the Eastern liturgy. So if the liturgy is a locus theologicus, yes. then I don't, I don't know what you're going to do with this triple virginity formula, because you're basically saying 250 million Orthodox and all the, yes. the Byzantine Christians are, 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 are saying something that's, mm -hmm. that's absurd. Yes. Well, as blessed, blessed John Henry Newman said, a revelation is not given if there be no authority to decide what it is that is given. Mm -hmm. So the revelation is there, but sometimes it takes a, a time to uh, express it and give it the precise formula, yeah. but it seems pretty consistent, and certainly the also the ever the, the perpetual virginity of Mary. But it's why have the threefold virginity? That why was that the formula mm. at that synod of Lateran in six forty nine? Yeah. So yeah. I'm convinced now, and and so it's always good to know we could correct mm. what we've published before, and I never doubted it. Mm -hmm. But um, I I uh, I was looking at the way it was handled at Vatican II and that Janssen's and some others, you know, raised doubts about it. Mm -hmm. But people had raised doubts about Mary's title of mediatrix, too, mm -hmm. which was unbelievable. I mean, mm -hmm. but thankfully the Holy Spirit intervened, and, and it, was, it was put in, in, the, in the, um, the final document of Lumen Gentium Chapter 8. Monsignor? If I might add, too, I think the exegesis of Ignace de la Poterie mm -hmm. is unparalleled in mm -hmm. terms of what he shows, and John Paul II indirectly cited him in his uh, mm -hmm. Marian Catechesis yeah. about the way to, uh, to render um, he will be called holy. He says it's, it's an adverb. He will be born in a holy manner or holily, mm -hmm. which means with ritual purity and uh, added, a, a, I think, a, a great deal. Mm. That's right. Uh, and also his translation of John 1, is it 18? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes, about yeah. bloods. It, yes. No, that's Ex sanguinibus. Right. That's and right. And that uh, this always referred to the ritual right. um, shedding of blood. I'm glad you brought that up because the, the Eastern patristic tradition is very concerned about this point, is mm. that she was exempt from from uh, the blood, so to speak, mm. uh, ritual impurities. Mm -hmm. And St. Augustine, who didn't understand Greek, didn't get it. But I, when I celebrate the traditional Mass, so-called, I, I always think of De La Poterie when I say mm. non ex sanguinibus, because he argues that the earliest translation was a reference to Jesus, not to those who were, uh, mm -hmm. those of us who become adopted mm -hmm. sons in him. Mm -hmm. um, and that he believes the... Uh, the shift was made in order to uh, insist against the Arians mm -hmm. on uh, the divinity of Christ. But any, I can't go into all of his no, exegesis. No, no, thank you very you much. I think we've run out of time. All right, we, we have, and uh, thank you, thank you, Robert, uh, for this magnificent presentation. And it dovetails beautifully into what Father Ford's going to do in 15 minutes on Newman and SCOTUS.